All right, Proverbs chapter number 20. Starting off strong here with verse number 1. Verse number 1 reads, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. I'm not going to spend too much time on this topic tonight. I've done it in the past, and we're going to do it again in chapter 23. However, this is a, a topic that does hit home personally for me. This is something that I was involved with for many years of my life and wasted many years of my life and got in all kinds of sin because of the sin of alcohol and because of the sin of drunkenness. And we see the warnings throughout the Bible. We see that, that drunkenness is listed along with many other extremely wicked sins in the Bible. And, and when it gives those lists in Galatians chapter 6 and in Revelation chapter 20, it gives, it gives these, these various lists of people who shall not inherit the kingdom of God, drunkenness is listed in those lists. And it's a very serious sin. And it's something we want to make sure. The Bible tells us right here in the book of wisdom that wine is a mocker. What does that mean? It's going to mock you. It's going to make a fool out of you. It's going to make you look like an idiot. You get involved with drinking booze. You get involved with drinking, drinking alcohol. It's going to mock you. It's going to make you look like a fool. The Bible says strong drink is raging. And whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. You let alcohol deceive you. You think, oh, it's okay. Oh, it's fine for me to, to, to drink a little bit. I could drink here and there. You're not wise. You don't have wisdom. Don't be deceived by booze. Don't be deceived also by the lying prophets that are out there that are going to tell you that social drinking is okay. Oh, just drink, but you can drink in moderation, and that's just fine. It's a lie. Don't be deceived by the lie because it's not okay. Here's what happens. Here's the reality of the situation. Anyone, you know, when you start off and you have that first drink, you are already on your way to drunkenness. You have already allowed the alcohol to come in your body. Not everybody's body reacts the same. Not even your own body is always going to react the same. Sometimes you have food in your stomach, sometimes you don't. And sometimes you're more tired, sometimes you've got other things going on. Maybe you're taking some other medications. There's all kinds of different things that can affect you. And here's the problem with that. What happens if you, you know, you start to get drunk? You've already, you've already gotten into sin. If you were to say that it's not sin, you know, up to a certain point, you're always, you're going to end up crossing that line without fail. You're going to end up crossing that line of when you've had too much. And, you know, by the time you're stumbling around and vomiting and stuff, you're way past the, the time when it's too much. But you know what's too much? The very first drink. You shouldn't get involved with any of it. There's, there's, there's plenty of people. If you want to lie to yourself, you could go and listen to some preacher out there going to tell you that, oh, drinking is just fine. Just don't get drunk. In uh, Micah chapter 2, verse 11, the Bible says, If a man walking in the spirit and falsehood do lie, saying, I will prophesy unto thee of wine and of strong drink, he shall even be the prophet of this people. That's a disparaging remark there, talking about the people saying, oh yeah, if you've got just some prophet saying, well, I'll prophesy unto you of wine, of strong drink, basically saying that it's okay to drink that stuff, then he's saying that will be, even be the prophet of this people. Watch out for those, for those preachers that are going to tell you that drinking, drinking booze is fine and drinking alcohol is okay. The Bible says that wine is a mocker. Wine itself is a mocker. Amen. What does it say? It doesn't say that about any other drink or any other food or anything like that. It's talking about alcohol. Being a mocker. Why would you even want to have one glass of a drink that's called a mocker? Wine's a mocker. You'll be made a fool of. Don't fall into that trap. Like I said, we're going to be getting this subject much, much more in the future. We're going to be coming up um, just in the next couple of weeks. This topic comes up over and over again. We're going through the, the book of Proverbs. We want to be wise. We want to have wisdom. We want to have knowledge. And if you are deceived by alcohol, you are not wise. It's poison. It's literally a poison for your body. It affects your body like a poison does. It's going to kill your brain cells. It's going to cause you to do stupid things. And it costs a whole bunch of money. Don't be deceived by the wine. Let's keep reading here. We're going to get into a section now um, regarding kings. And just, just in general. Now, we don't live under the rulership of a king. So we're going to apply these verses just for a ruler anyways, because these verses will still fit with a ruler of a land. It doesn't have to necessarily be a king. Look at verse number two. The fear of a king is as the roaring of a lion. Whoso provoketh him to anger sinneth against his own soul. Basically saying it's not a good idea to get the king mad at you because he's going to bring 
evil unto you because the king has power to do that, right? He has the power to, to do those things. So you don't want to just provoke the ruler to anger. It's not a wise thing to do. It's a really foolish thing to do. Look, jump down to verse number 8. The Bible says, A king that sitteth in the throne of judgment scattereth away all evil with his eyes. Now, I had mentioned this a, free, in, in a few weeks ago when we had other, a lot of other verses that dealt with kings. The king that the Bible is referring to in all these Proverbs is, is, a, is a righteous king. A king that's a godly king. A king that is, that is sitting in the throne of judgment that, that has an authority that's there given by God. And, and this is a king. We already, we're not going to do it tonight. We went back to the Old Testament. We saw the king is supposed to write out his own copy of the law. He's supposed to read therein all the days of his life. He's supposed to not pervert judgment. That is the way that a king ought to rule a kingdom. And when we see verses like this, a king that sitteth in the throne of judgment, scattereth away all evil with his eyes. That's talking about a righteous king there. And, and people who do evil should be afraid of a righteous king being able to, to give judgment on, on his throne of judgment. Jump down to verse number 26. Verse number 26. A wise king scattereth the wicked and bringeth the wheel over them. The wise king is going to scatter the wicked. He's going to make them flee from him. Right? He's going he's to break up their groups, cause them all to go separate ways, and says, and bring it the wheel over there. He's going to destroy them. Okay? He's going he's to get rid of them, get them out of the land. Just like all of the righteous kings, the wise kings, in the, in the, um, through the, you read through the books of the, of the Chronicles and the kings of Israel and of Judah, when you read through those, those records, Oftentimes you'll see, well, multiple times, not necessarily oftentimes, a few times in the Bible you'll see a righteous king, a godly king, getting rid of the Sodomites out of the land. And he uses that language. It says, you know, um, King Jehoshaphat was a righteous king, and here's all the things he did, and he drove the Sodomites out of the land. And he got rid of them. And what's that doing? He's scattering the wicked. He's breaking them up. He's bringing a wheel over them. Now, has the wisdom of Proverbs ceased? I mean, a lot of people say, oh, that's the Old Testament. You know, let's just stick to the New Testament. The book of Proverbs is a book of wisdom. Okay, this is timeless wisdom. This is wisdom that does not cease. We can look to this book for wisdom. No matter what time you live in, we can find truth in this book. It is wise for the ruler to scatter the wicked. Any wise king is going to want to have a righteous kingdom. A kingdom where truth is exalted. A kingdom where, where judgment is proper and is just. And people, you know, are, are receiving um, equity and fairness under the law. And when wickedness is being punished and is being punished properly. Don't let the wicked group together and form organizations and form factions and start coming to power because that's what's going to happen when you're not scattering the wicked and you let them just form up, group up, and, and try to get strength that way. You get what we're seeing today all over the world. The wicked sodomite organizations that are out there that are fighting against righteousness. A wise king or ruler is going to scatter and destroy them. But when you, when, you, when you don't scatter them, when you don't destroy them, and when you got wicked kings in charge, the, you know, the evil aren't going to flee away. He's not going to scatter the wicked because he's wicked himself. And that's the situation we're in today, and that's the situation we see in many places all over the world. Because people have gotten soft on judgment, on what's right, on righteous judgment. See, <laughs> We have lost our senses. People have become these bleeding hearts and want to just pretty much have no consequences for crime, for, for criminal acts. And there's a big problem with that. It's not just anymore. When someone commits a horrible crime, when someone commits a, a crime, especially like a crime that the Bible says is worthy of death, but then they just, they don't receive the just recompense of their reward when they don't receive what, what is called for as far as justice goes. You're not doing anybody a favor. 
You think you're helping out the person that got, that got busted, that got caught, that committed a crime. You think by, by, by giving him all his leniency, you think you're helping him out, but you're not. You might, you know, in the short term, physically help that one person out for the moment, but you know what you're doing? You're sending a, a message to everyone else that, you know what, what he did really isn't that bad. When you start not making the crime. A perfect example, pedophilia. What kind of message are we sending to anybody when someone can defile and, and abuse a little, helpless, defenseless child and screw them up for the rest of their life and they get a slap on the wrist and they get three years in prison? Three years in jail! And they ruin and destroy some kids' lives to where those kids now are going to have to see that person again just after a few short years. What good does that do to anybody? It corrupts the society. No, the, the crime, the punishment needs to be fitting the crime. And you know what? God has spelled out a righteous judgment for the way that we ought to have our laws on this earth. There are many reasons to have good laws. One of them is that they're supposed to be a deterrent. When you have a stiff penalty, when you have a death penalty, obviously, you know, you're not gonna, that person's not going to change. So we get in this attitude of, well, people can reform. Oh, they're going to get better. Whether they can or can't isn't even the point. Because one of the reasons for having a, a punishment like the death penalty is to be a deterrent. It's to get people not to do it in the first place. Not, oh, can we fix this problem and make this person never kill again? No, if they murder somebody, you know what? The punishment is death. And that's where it stands. And that's going to, people are going to, if you see that, if you know that, and you know that the executions are actually being carried out, that's going to deter people from going forward and committing murder. But when you commit murder and you see other people commit murder and then you see them in these prisons and you see them, you know, it's not the best life, but you still see them eating and drinking and maybe watching TV and working out and doing all this stuff. Well, now all of a sudden, if you really want to kill somebody, consequences aren't quite as bad. You're not just going to automatically lose your life. Well, if I get caught, maybe I'll go to prison. But see, the stakes are much lower then. And it just leads to more people doing these horrible crimes because there's not as much of a fear of a, of a punishment, of a righteous judgment being handed down. Adultery, kidnapping, child molestation. Okay, these are all things that the Bible would say is worthy of death. And the, the softer we get on these things the worse it's going to come. It's going to grow out of control and, and there's no sense of justice. And then when you, have, when you have people going to prison for like growing a plant. Now look, I'm not for people getting high. I'm not for marijuana. I'm not for drugs and people taking drugs and, 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 and getting poisoned, getting drunken and, and, and whatever else. It's a sin and it's wicked. But when you take something like that, which is a much lesser offense, and actually it's not even a crime, it's a sin. There's a difference. There's a difference between someone committing a crime and somebody sinning. Drunkenness in the Bible is a sin. We saw that in verse number one. We see that all throughout the Bible. Getting drunk is a sin, but guess what? In God's righteous law, He never put a penalty against getting drunk. There is no crime of drunkenness in the Bible. God did not say you have to take someone and punish them in this way or that way if they get drunk. It was not against the law. It's a sin. It's against God's law in the sense that, you know, we break one of God's laws as a sin, but it's not a crime in, a, in the human government. But now we have people, you know, for doing something similar to drunkenness, which of course alcohol is legal, but, but smoking a joint's not even though it does practically the same exact thing, and one's a plant and the other one is, you know, a liquid, but people going to prison for 20, 30, 40, 50, even a lifetime over, over having a substance. Yet, the people who defile children are getting off just after a couple years. It's, it's backwards. 
There's no justice. There's no judgment. There's no equity there. It's a wicked government. It's a wicked thing that we have in place. And it's just going to breed more wickedness. The wise king will scatter the wicked. Look at, jump down to verse 28. We just were in 26. Look at verse number 28. The Bible reads, Mercy and truth preserve the king, and his throne is upholden by mercy. Mercy and truth. There is a level of mercy that, that can be extended. And see, here's the thing. With, think about this. When it comes to judgment, and it comes to righteous judgment, and it comes to a righteous recompense, there is a righteous, you know, in order for, for a judge to be a good judge, just like God is a good judge, God is a righteous judge, He created His laws, and He created the penalty for those laws, for breaking those laws, for sinning. You can't take God's mercy and grace that is extended to us if you're, go, if you're going to apply that to our laws, you have to apply it the same way because here's what happened. When God forgives you of your sins, those sins have not gone unpunished. The penalty was still paid. So God is still the righteous judge. So every single sin that you commit in this lifetime, whether it's lying, stealing, whatever, anything that you do, all of those sins there is a penalty for. There is a price to pay for those sins. But thankfully, we had someone that took our place to pay for those sins. And don't ever forget that. As you continue, as a, as a born-again believer, as you live your life, don't ever forget the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for you because every time that you sin, still going forward, just think, Jesus Christ spent time in hell for that sin. How does that make you feel about a Savior that loved you to save you, to give you a new life? When you commit those sins, you're heaping it on, on Jesus Christ. It should be enough to make you not want to do those things anymore. When someone does something like that for you, to then, you know, oh, well, whatever, I'm saved anyways, what's the big deal? Well, everyone's out doing this, so who cares? You just... You just throwing that much more sin onto Jesus to pay that for you. There is mercy extended for us. That's absolutely true. But the, but the judgment was still righteous and it was still righteously paid for through Jesus Christ. Go back up to verse number 3. Proverbs 20 verse 3. The Bible reads, it is an honor for a man to cease from strife, but every fool will be meddling. It's an honor. It's a good thing. It'll, it brings glory, excuse me, unto you to cease from strife, to, stop, to be the one. You get involved with a conflict with somebody, you get involved with a fight with somebody, to be the one to just stop it off. Just, just say, well, you can keep fighting, but I'm done. And, and to just be able to be the bigger man, the bigger person to be able to say, I'm done. I'm not going to just continue you know, some, some vain fight. Now, obviously, we're to contend for the faith, but that's not what we're talking about here with a strife. It's just some, some fight that, that doesn't have to do with, you know, with you standing on God's word. Just, you know, people get into fights all the time. They have nothing to do with, with your faith. And it's an honor to be able to cease from strife. But it says, but every fool will be meddling. A wise person is going to avoid the fights, get away from them, find a way for it to, st to stop. The fool is going to continue getting involved, continue messing with people, continue and, and adding uh, flames to that fire. Look at verse 4. The sluggard will not plow by reason of the cold. Therefore shall he beg and harvest and have nothing. The Bible is very, very clear that we need to be hard workers. Now, Think about this. It says the sluggard will not plow by reason of the cold. Plowing, first of all, in itself is hard work. Going out and digging up the ground, getting the ground ready, tilling the ground. See, nowadays we have all these tools and, and, and all these mechanics to be able to, to kind of help make that job easier. It's still a hard job, but there's a lot more to it. You know, I, I was tilling out my, um, my yard, my front yard and my backyard, and, uh, and Brother Wayne gave me his, his, um, his rototiller to be able to, to help with that. 
And that was still, now it made the job a lot easier, man. That brought, it, it dug up that ground real nice and real good, but it still was kind of hard to do that. Doing this work is hard. And what this is referring to is going out and plowing, right, in the springtime, plowing early on to be able to, to plant the seeds to reap them in harvest that comes much later. You have to get started working early on and work really hard in order to get anything back from that. And we need to keep this mindset. We need to be able to keep a good work ethic and a strong attitude and a strong will and strong faith to know that if I'm putting in my hours, if I'm going out, if I'm working hard, if I'm doing as much as I can do to work, then there will be a result in the end. I will end up receiving a reward for my work, for the work that I put in. But see, the slugger says, well, it's already hard enough as it is, but it's cold outside. You know, when you get started playing, you might, there might still be frost on the ground. Oh, I'm going to stay, you know, cuddled up in my, in my nice, big, warm comforter because it's just too cold outside. And when you have that type of an attitude of, of being too easily overcome by the obstacles or things that just seem too difficult to you, you're not going to reap. It's a, here, in, in this case, you're going to go hungry. Why? Because you're not going to have any crops. If you don't go out and do the plowing when it's cold outside, if you don't get your butt up and start doing this stuff, well, when it comes harvest, you can't be, you can't be upset when you don't have anything, when you're begging for food because you didn't do the work. We all have challenges in this life. We all have problems. We all have issues. Everybody wants to think that their problems are super unique. We all do. I know of, I mean, almost everybody I know has deals with some kind of pain, some kind of issue, some kind of problem in their life. And there are people that will take that pain, take that problem and just deal with it and keep moving forward and keep working. And there's other people who just make it, destroy them and say, I'm not going to do anything. We need to be, and see, here's where the, where the, the toughness comes in. We need a mental toughness. We need a spiritual toughness. We need to be able to say, I can do this. There is a, there's a lot that I gain. You know, there, there's things that, that you do in life that can teach you great truths. Um, you, you could get all the truths from the Bible, but some that you're able to learn on your own. One of the things I was able to learn w was actually through sports, through training, through doing physical workouts and physical training of something that's very difficult to do. But in the end, you reap the, you know, you get stronger. If you, if you could push yourself, if you can do the, the hard stuff, you could, you could gain one, you start to gain momentum in your mind and in your, your mental strength. The first time you do something difficult, the first time you do something really hard that you don't want to do. I remember the first time I got up at, at five in the morning or whatever time it was, to go and do, I was, I, was a, I was a competitive swimmer growing up and, and got up in high school for one, of the, for one of the, you know, when it got closer to the end of the season, we would have morning practices and evening practices and getting up super early in the morning, way before school, it's cold outside, you're tired, you don't want to go do it, you get up, you go anyways. Well, after the first time you do it, you realize, you get there, you start going, okay, yeah, man, this stinks, whatever. And then you get done with it. And then you realize, you know what, it really wasn't that bad. And then the next time you do it again, and you do it again. And you start building experience, you start building and realizing, hey, this is something that can actually become normal. And you know what, this is the way that humans work. When you are put into situations, we adapt. People adapt to various situations. There's people in other parts of the world that, guess what? They don't even have plumbing. They don't have electricity in their houses. And to us these days, it's like, how could you not have those things? How could you even survive? I don't know what I would do with all, all that. But people survive. They adapt to what they have. It just becomes normal. It becomes routine. But see, sometimes when there's something difficult, an obstacle in your path, whether it be pain, whether it be whatever, whether it be cold outside, whether it's raining, whatever the, the situation may be, you have to be able to overcome that. You have to be able to push yourself and say, I can do this. I can do this. 
and you do it the first time, it's going to give you confidence, it's going to give you strength to continue to keep moving forward and to keep pushing the bar. And the more, you know, even with the physical workouts, you know, you, you can look at, well, the goal is, is just unattainable. There's no way I could get that. Well, you have to look at each day at a time, one day. You got to keep on adding a little bit on, on top of each other. It, each day, progress a little bit more, a little bit more, and just stay in it. Stay consistent. Stay going strong. And just like you have to do, a farmer has to do, they have to plow. And they have to plow. The plowing's not done in one day. You have to go out and plow and plow and plow and plow and plow and plow. And when the plowing's done, then you guys are planting and planting and watering and, and cultivating. And then you go out and it's time to harvest. And, and, it's, and it's continual progression and work. But you know what? At the end, the harvest, you yield bountifully. You put in all that work. You put in all that time. Then you get to the harvest. And we need to realize that the reward doesn't always come right away. It might take some time. But if we are putting forth effort, you will get rewarded. And if you're not rewarded, you know, by, because you're working hard for a boss, God will see that and he'll make sure you're rewarded. God rewards you for the work that you put in. We need to be strengthened in our spirit. We need to be strengthened in our mind and, and ready to, to handle things and not allow. Because you know what? Being a sluggard, it's a state of mind. It's not a physical attribute, it's a state of mind. There are people that are weak, there are people that are strong, but if you have the right mindset, even the weak can be strong enough to do the things they need to do. And the more you do, the stronger you get. The sluggard will not plow by reason of the cold, therefore shall he beg in harvest and have nothing. Unfortunately, the sluggard usually doesn't have any clue why he's begging. It's just, oh, there's all these problems and this is going on and that is going on. When the real problem is that you're just lazy. Look at verse number 13. The Bible reads, Love not sleep, lest thou come to poverty. Open thine eyes and thou shalt be satisfied with bread. Again, you know, you can say, oh, I have it rough. Oh, man, I'm just so tired. Sometimes you just need to get yourself up out of bed. Don't love just, just, just continuing to rest and sleep. Now look, we all need sleep for our health. Okay? We, we all do. I mean, it's a fact. We're, we're human beings. We need to get some rest. We need to get a, a ample rest to, to, to recharge our bodies, to get us ready to go again. But we ought not to just be sleeping, taking naps, loving to sleep, and just, oh man, you know, the... It's noon and the sun's coming in your room and you're still pulling the covers over your head and just, just want to sleep. Look, open your eyes. Get up. Get moving. And this could be difficult, especially if you're, if, you're, if you're dealing with some emotional problems. Okay? This might be something that's harder to do when you're, when you're, when you're battling with something that's, uh, that's, that's either depressing in your life or you're having some other issues. But I'll tell you what, don't give in to those problems. You're only going to make it worse by not getting up, by not getting out of bed, by just staying in, in, in succumbing to the weakness, the weak state of mind or the weakness that you feel in your body. Most problems that we have, in, you know, even physically, need to be worked out. A lot of people, their, their injuries and their problems get worse when you don't use those muscles and you just let it get stagnant because you think that, oh, this hurts when I step on it, so I'm not going to step on it anymore. Careful with that because sometimes when you, when you, when you stretch, you, know, you, you pull muscles or do things, you need to keep them. Now, I'm not talking about just overusing them and abusing it, but, but you need to just keep the motion going. You need to keep moving and that will oftentimes help you. I mean, that's why that when you have physical therapy, what are you doing? You're constantly moving whatever your injured part of your body was. When I got in a car wreck and, and, and I broke my wrist and I had a surgery and everything else, what did I do after that? I went to physical therapy. What did physical therapy do? We just kept moving and kept working on it and kept doing things. You know what? It hurt. It didn't feel good. It was not something I looked forward to doing. But you get through it because it's helping you. When you have the problems and you're not feeling good and you're, and you're depressed and you've got other issues, get up. Force yourself up knowing 
that it will help you. Having enough foresight to say, this will help me. I do need to get up. I do need to go to work. I do need to get out of the house. I do need to start doing things. That's wisdom. Let's, let's keep moving on here in our, in our chapter. Look at verse number 5. The Bible reads, Counsel in the heart of man is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. So having good counsel, good advice, good wisdom, it's like deep water. Right? If you've got a well and the water is real deep, it's real hard to get to, it might take a lot to, to draw it out, but a man of understanding, the Bible says, will draw it out. Um, wisdom is not something that just comes easily. Wisdom is something that comes over time. Now, God will pour out wisdom. You need to ask Him, but we need to be reading. We need to be seeking out good godly counsel. And uh, good counsel is going to come from the deep waters, not just the shallow surface stuff. That's where you're going to find the, the best advice and the best counsel. Uh, jump down to verse number 18. The Bible says, Every purpose is established by counsel. Everything you're looking to do is established. It's established. It's, it's formed. It's, it's, it's made more solid by getting good advice, by getting good counsel. And with good advice, make war. Now, this is talking about making war. Making war is not something that should be taken lightly, right? It's, it's, not, it's not some flippant decision that you make. Well, I'm going to go to war with this country. And it, you know, no, you're going to sit down. You're going to count the cost. You're going to see how much strength do we have, how many soldiers we have, what's the enemy you have, you know, and, and really figure it out. And then you're going to talk to people and say, well, what can we do? How much, you know, like, what are our resources? What are we able to do? And talk to people. Should we even get involved in this fight? Is this something that we could win? Is this, you know, and, 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 and establish all of your... Um, your, your, opp your opportunities and your options because it's not a light thing and our purpose is the things that we want to do in our life. We ought to get uh, good counsel and get good advice to make the, the important decisions in our life, the things that are going to be um, have a big impact on our life. Jump back up to verse number 6. Verse number 6. Paul reads, most men will proclaim every one his own goodness, but a faithful man who can find. Almost everybody out there is going to say, yeah, I'm pretty good. I'm a good person. I mean, we run into people all the time, right? I'm pretty good. I'm a good person, right? You go out soul winning. You go into heaven. Yeah, I'm pretty good. I'm a, I'm, I'm a good guy. Everyone's good in their own eyes, right? Who's to say, you know, very few. Every once in a while, I'll run into someone and just like, you know what? I'm bad. I'm just, I'm just not a good guy at all. I'm probably going to hell. You know what? And, and praise the Lord for people like that because sometimes they can be very open to the gospel when they already know that they, that they are a sinner and they deserve hell. But um, it says, that's why it says most men, the majority of people, they're going to proclaim their own goodness. They're going to say how great they are. And that's, you know, this is where politicians are at. So they've got this down to a T. Oh, vote for me because I'm so good at this and I'm going to fix this and I'm going to do that. And me, 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 I'm so great. You want to vote for me because I'm awesome and I'm going to fix everything. I've got all of your problems, right? But a faithful man who can find. It's not that important for someone to blow their own trumpet and tell the world how great they are. That doesn't mean anything. That's vain. What you really want to find is the faithful man, someone who's faithful, someone who's full of faith in God, but someone who's also dependable, someone you can trust, someone you can rely on. That's what you really want, not just someone who's going to proclaim their own goodness. Look at verse number 15. Verse number 15, the Bible, the Bible reads, There is gold and a multitude, a multitude of rubies, but the lips of knowledge are a precious jewel. Saying, yeah, there's money, there's gold, there's rubies, there's all, there's all this stuff out there, but the lips of knowledge. And again, it's just putting a price on someone who speaks the truth, someone who has wisdom, someone who has knowledge. And, and we've seen this all, like, in just about every single chapter of Proverbs, talking about the great price of having wisdom, of being smart, having understanding. It's a precious jewel. What is precious? It's, it's very pricey. And why is a precious jewel precious? Because it's hard to find. Right? It's not common. Um, lips of knowledge, someone speaking the truth is rare. It's like that precious jewel. Uh, jump up to verse number 7. Verse number 7, the Bible reads, The just man walketh in his integrity. His children are blessed after him. You want your children to be blessed? Walk in your integrity. Do what's right. Live a life of integrity where you're living by principles, where you're living by godly rules. And the Bible says your children will be blessed. 
That's a great promise. Look at verse number 9. The Bible says, Who can say, I have made my heart clean, I am pure from my sin? Now, there's a movement out there, believe it or not. Keep your finger here and turn, if you would, to 1 John chapter 1. Because this is a true I mean, this is a great statement. I know it's just a question, but the answer is nobody, right? Who can say, I have made, I have made my heart clean? Now, your heart can be clean, but it's not you that makes it clean. It's Jesus Christ that washes it clean with his blood. I have made my heart clean. I am pure from my sins. Nobody can say that. But there is a movement out there. It's called the holiness movement. It's been around for a little while now. And what the people in that movement believe is that you can actually achieve a state of sinless perfection. They believe, like, you know, you get saved, and then after that, you can just live such a holy life that you don't even sin anymore. I've talked to some of these people at the door. It's, it's amazing how proud they are. It's amazing how full of themselves they are. And they think, well, yeah, I haven't sinned in months or years. <laughs> I'm thinking, you never read your Bible. That's why you think you can't, you're not sinning. Because anybody who reads the Bible and actually goes through it is going to realize, I really am a sinner. There's a lot more to this book. There's a lot more sins than just the two or three things that I've got in my mind making me think that I'm perfect. But I'll tell you what, the reason why I'm bringing this up, I found this statistic online. As of 2015, just as of last year, the Holiest Movement churches had an estimated 12 million adher adherents. 12 million people follow this type of nonsense. It's still out there. I mean, it was a lot bigger, I think, in like the 70s. I know it was like the Holy Roller movement and this holiness movement of people thinking that they're just so holy. And that's where the holier than thou came from. These people that, that they think, I'm without sin, and, but you're a sinner and having this type of an attitude, right? And which really turns people off for good reason because they're just hip hypocrites and everybody knows it when you think that you're just so much better than someone else and you say that you're not a sinner and they are a sinner. But, um, yeah, in, in order to even think that, you know, for one, you have to not be reading your Bible, but for two, the standard has to be set really, really low. When you set the bar way down here, it's easy to make it over that bar, right? And just to feel good about yourself. But the higher you raise that standard the much more difficult it becomes to, to be perfect. The problem is, God's standard is out of our reach. It is really high. We cannot attain to it. Look at 1 John chapter 1. Look at verse number 8. The Bible reads, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. You're just tricking yourself if you say you don't have any sin. And the truth is not in us. Say, if we say we don't have any sins, we're lying to ourselves, and we don't have the truth. Verse number 9, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. How do we make God a liar? Because the Bible says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all sinners. None of us is without sin. And if you think that you are, then you're making God a liar. Don't be deceived by, these, by this holiness movement. They turn people on because outwardly they look a little bit different than other people and they, they try to lead these lives that are, that are supposedly so righteous, right? And some of the things that they believe are right on. You know, what would the, some of the standards that they have might be just fine. But the main problem comes in when you say that you're living without sin. Because the Bible even says in, in the book of Proverbs that the thought of foolishness is sin. You mean to tell me that you don't have any foolish thoughts ever? I mean, what does foolish mean? And foolish doesn't even have to necessarily mean sinful. It just means stupid. I don't know anyone that doesn't have a stupid thought. A lot of people express their stupid thoughts because <laughs> come out and make stupid statements. Okay? But um, no, the, the standard is really high. There's a lot of things that, that we do. There's a lot of things that you do you might not even realize are a sin. There are things that, that, that you could be doing that right now that just because you, you haven't you know, found it in the Bible or you haven't understood it properly, that, that no, this actually is a sin. I mean, there's, there's sins of ignorance happen all the time. 
It's folly and it's shame to think that you do not have sin. Uh, let's go back to Proverbs. Go back to Proverbs 20. Look at verse number 10. The Bible reads, Divers weights and divers measures. Both of them are alike abomination to the Lord. God hates it when people are dishonest. God hates it when you use, and that's what it means by using divers as different weights and different measurements. So when, you're, when, you're, when you've got a special, you know, people used to weigh things out to, when you would do transactions, you know, weigh out the money or weigh out the food or whatever. I mean, you go to a grocery store still and there's, you're weighing to see how much, you know, bananas are however 50 cents a pound or whatever. You need to, to weigh them out in order to, to, to see how much you owe, right? Well, if you've got a, if you're a corrupt person, when someone comes into the grocery store and you want to charge them more, right? You could have you could have that weight just a little bit skewed, a little bit off, to be in your favor to make everything a little bit heavier. And then everyone that comes through, and that you know, and people do that. And that's why there's even a department of weights and measures in the government because they try to, to monitor that and keep people honest to uh, from 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 tricking people and you know because you go to a gas pump. You don't know how much is going through that gas pump. You, you have to trust them that, that the, the little spinner, you know, when it tells you how many gallons that you pumped is, is right and accurate. And, you know, oftentimes we'll never know. But God knows. That's another one of those things. You think you get away with it. You think that, that you can just go ahead and, and cheat people because they'll never know the difference. God knows about it. And God hates that. He says it's, he thinks it's an abomination. Look at verse number 11. The Bible says, Even a child is known by his doings, whether his work be pure and whether it be right. Our actions speak louder than words. A child is known by his doings, the things that you do. Even a child, whether his work be pure and whether it be right. The, the things that you do in this life, your actions will speak on whether or not you're doing what's right. Look at verse number 12. The hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord hath made even both of them. Never forget that. God knows everything. He's the one that created us. He created the eyes. He created the ears. He knows all about what's going on with us. Look at verse number 14. It is not, it is not, said the buyer, but when he has gone his way, then he boasteth. This is a good little bit of wisdom too about buying things. I, I, what, I, what I believe the verse is talking about is, is the haggling game. Right? So before you purchase something, you're the buyer. Because this is saying it's not, not just means like nothing. Oh, it's nothing. It's nothing. Right? When, uh, when the buyer says that, it says, but when he has gone his way, then he boasts. So when you're talking to the person selling, you're going to point out all the things that are wrong, right? All the things that are bad. You go out to buy a car, like, well, you know, they're trying to say all the good things, right? Oh, it's got this, it's got that. And you're like, yeah, but it's, you know, I got this dent over here, we got the scratch over here, I'm going to have to put some money into this. And, and, you're, and, you're, and you're trying to, to, to drive the price down, right? And then after the purchase, you go out and you're like, Hey, look how awesome this is! And, you know, you're boasting about, about what a great deal you got or whatever. So there's a, that's just a, a I, I like that proverb. You know, it's not, it's not set the buyer, but when he's gone his way, then he boasted. Look at verse number 16. Verse number 16, Take his garment that is surety for a stranger and take a pledge of him for a strange woman. Now, I'm not going to get too much into depth in this. I've gone over this in the past. Uh, what this is talking about is taking collateral for loans. When someone is surety for someone else, they're putting their name on the loan saying, yes, I'm responsible for this. And taking a pledge of a person means it's like a down payment. It's something that you're saying, here, I'm gonna, you're going to loan me some money and I'm going to give you this to put down because I don't want to lose this. So then I'll come back when I'm able to pay you back and you, give, you return that to me. Right? And, uh, and that's the way it worked. And this is something that he's talking about here with foreigners. And the Bible talks a lot about like um, lending on usury and doing things like that. And you're not supposed to do that with your brethren, but on the stranger, on the foreigner, it was allowed. And he's saying here, with a foreigner, you want to make sure that you get that collateral. You want to make sure that you take that. It's a wise thing to do because they're a foreigner. You don't know what they're going to do. You need to just make sure that you get yourself covered by taking the collateral. Um, continuing on here, look at verse number 17. Verse number 17, bread of deceit is sweet to a man, but afterwards his mouth shall be filled with gravel. And this reminds me when we're talking about the, the, the woman, the, the um, adulterous woman who is trying to deceive the simple man into, into committing adultery, committing fornication, saying, you know, stolen bread, stolen waters are sweet, you know, and trying to say it's, it's, it's better when, when you steal something. 
And this is saying bread of deceit. When you deceive someone out of it and you get a gain out of lying, out of tricking somebody, you know, being deceptive, it says that's sweet to man. Yeah, when you make that quick buck, you know, people get a, 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 a high out of that or a feeling like, yeah, I pulled one over on that guy and you're feeling real great and proud because now you got all this money and you didn't even have to do much for it because you tricked him, you were deceptive. It says, but look at this, but afterwards his mouth shall be filled with gravel. You reap what you sow. You think, you think it's so great up front, but watch out because it's going to come and get you in the end. And, oh man, it almost hurts to think about a just a mouthful of gravel that's grinding on, on rocks and stuff in your mouth. Yeah, not a good thing. So, so watch out for, for people who want to draw you into that, that wickedness. Uh, look at verse number 19. He that goeth about as a talebearer revealeth secrets. Therefore, meddle not with him that flattereth with his lips. This is a warning here explaining that the person who goes around and tells stories and gossips is also, could also have the attribute of being a flatterer. Nobody wants, no one wants your secrets being told and, and, and you know, told to someone who's just going to go and tell everybody else. You want to be able to, to have confidence in someone and be able to trust that they could keep secrets. If you, you, know, you, you get a friend, you get someone, you, you want to talk about things that are personal to you, you don't want them going around and spreading news about you. So how do you watch out for people like that? Well, look out for the person who's full of flattery. The person who really lays it on thick and wants to tell you how great you are and tell you all these nice things about you. But the reason why you watch out for that is because they're setting a trap. They're trying to gain your confidence. These people that are just overly nice and overly friendly and overly telling you all these good things. It's called flattery. And it's, it's, a, it's a big red flag. Watch out for it. Don't trust the person that is, that is using flattery. Watch out for them. Look at verse number 20. Whoso curseth his father or his mother, his lamp shall be put out in obscure darkness. This is a very serious thing in the Bible. And this is something that, again, we're, we're turning into a society of, of, of people that have children that despise their parents, that don't honor their mother and father, that curse their mother and their father. And that is a serious curse. That is a big deal. God put a lot of emphasis on the authority of the parents in the household and, and, the, and the reverence and the respect that they are due from their children. And, they, and, and, it's, and it's part of the foundation of a society is the family unit, is the family structure. And God knows this, and it's extremely important. I'm going to read for you. Turn, if you would, to Matthew 15. I'm going to read for you out of the law. Because not only is this a proverb that says, hey, if you curse your father or mother, your lamp is going to be put out in obscure darkness. That was actually part of the law. God's law, Le Leviticus chapter 20, verse 9 says, For everyone that curseth his father or his mother shall be surely put to death. He hath cursed his father or his mother, his blood shall be upon him. You want to talk about judgment. And again, I was just talking about God having the righteous judgment. God knows what the right punishment is for the crimes. When somebody goes as far to curse their father or mother. Now think about that. What is a curse? A curse is when you are wishing or saying evil on someone else. Now, a lot of people get in fights, and you can say things, but a curse is like, you know, I wish you would just die and go to hell. That is a curse. That is a serious thing. And, and again, we, we live in a society where it's like people say all kinds of wicked things out of their mouth, and it doesn't even seem to matter anymore. There are kids out there today that are saying things like that to their parents, and it's wicked as hell, and God says that it's so bad that you need to put that person to death. That is a capital offense in God's eyes. Yet we don't seem to care anymore about our words, about the words of others. The words are powerful. And words like that, the Bible says, you know, when you curse your mother or your father, that is just, just pure wickedness. That was the Old Testament law, but look at what Jesus said in Matthew 15, because he brings this up. Matthew 15, verse number 3, he says, But he answered and said unto them, he's talking to the Pharisees, Why do ye also transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? For God commanded, saying, Honor thy father and mother, and he that curseth 
father or mother, let him die the death. So he's quoting this law that I just read in Leviticus 20. But ye say, whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, it is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Thus have ye made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. Ye hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. He's saying, you have completely upturned the, the laws of God by your own laws, by your own, by your own um, understandings, by your, by your own teachings. Because Jesus said, that, you know, the law says, honor your father and mother, and he that curses his father and mother, let him die the death. That's how seriously you're supposed to take, you know, taking care of your parents, honoring your father and mother. And, and I've mentioned this before, I'll say it again. Honoring is not just saying, just having a, a, a respect, like, verbally. It's taking care of them, taking care of your parents when they get old, taking care of your parents when they are in need. They brought you up from birth. They changed your diapers. They fed you. They took care of you. And when they get older, you are obligated to take care of your parents according to God's law. That is your responsibility. That is what you are obligated to do. But what the Pharisees did, they said, well, you just consider it lucky. You just consider it a gift by whatsoever you might be profited by me. Just count your lucky stars. No, that's your obligation and your duty. And if you don't do it, you're wicked and you're breaking God's commandments. Don't go around thinking that, oh, it's a gift for you. No, it's your responsibility. That's not a gift. And that's how the, how the Pharisees were breaking that commandment. But you can see how God put such an emphasis on doing this. This is, I mean, this is what we're supposed to do. This is God's law. Jump back to, uh, to Proverbs 20. Actually, no, stay, stay, go, go to Luke 15. Go to Luke 15. We're almost done. I'm going to read for you from Proverbs 20, verse 21. The Bible reads, An inheritance may be gotten hastily at the beginning, but the end thereof shall not be blessed. Um, so receiving an inheritance, getting it speedily, getting it hastily at the beginning, but the end not being blessed. I think a good example of this we see here with the prodigal son, this, this, this story of the prodigal son. The story of the prodigal son is the son that asked for his inheritance early. So he had a brother. There's, there's these two guys. They're, work, you know, they're, they, they're both sons of their father. He's saying, you know what, Dad? Can you just cut me my inheritance check right now? I mean, what a weird thing to say. Anyways, Dad's not even dead. He's asking for his inheritance already. But this is what, yeah, let's, let's read the story. Verse number 11, Luke 15, 11. And he said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare? I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. So this is exactly what this guy did. He got his inheritance hastily. He got it speedily. He got it early, right? And he went out and he wasted it. He wasted it. And, you know, the end thereof shall not be blessed. And he was not blessed in the end thereof. He spent all his money. He had riotous living. He was the life of the party. He had all his fun. Wasted it all, got to the point then to where he needs to be hired by, by this foreigner in the land that he went off to live in, in a wicked land, right away from, from, from the righteous land that he, was, he grew up in, went out into the world, and it said no man gave unto him. He was in want now, so he spent everything, now he's, he needs help. No one's given him anything. He gets his job where he's feeding pigs. And he's so hungry, he's lusting after the food that the pigs are eating, just wishing he could eat their food, that he's going and feeding the pigs. That's pretty low. 
Go back, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 20. Common theme, you know, don't go for the quick buck, whether it's through deceit, whether it's just, you know, you're doing it hastily, don't, you know, don't go for, the, for those quick methods. Put in the work, get up, work hard, do it right, and the end will be blessed. Proverbs 20, 22, Say not thou, I will recompense evil, but wait on the Lord, and he shall save thee. It's not our job to right every wrong. It's when someone does you wrong, it's not our job to go recompense that evil. I'll read for you out of Hebrews 10, verse 30. The Bible reads, For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense that the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. All the people that are doing wrong, to, you know, whether it's the people in Botswana, whether you know, when people get arrested, when people get, get, get hurt physically, when people get slandered, wh whatever the wrong may be, you know what? As a child of God, we could take satisfaction knowing that we don't even have to deal with it. You might, you might want to get that, that fleshly desire of, of you know, getting that person back. But if you feel that way, you could feel even better knowing that God will take care of you and do what's right. God will make sure that, that everything works its way out. Hey, you know, the, the, that um, you're going to reap what you sow, that doesn't just apply to you, that applies to everybody. So when people do you wrong, you just realize that and remember that. And just say what they're going to be getting from, whatever you could do to them, God can do way more. And, and it's not our job and it's not our place. And it's actually sin to go and, and, and recompense people evil. Leave the judging up to God in that regard. Let him right the wrongs. You just, just suffer it and keep moving forward and keep doing what God has for you to do. Um, verse 23, uh, we just went over this. Divers' weights are an abomination unto the Lord and a false balance is not good. Verse 24, man's goings are of the Lord. How can a man then understand his own way? It is a snare to the man who devoureth that which is holy and after vows to make inquiry. This is the, the shoot first, ask questions later mentality, right? This is, and it's saying it's a trap. It's a snare. When, when a person goes out and devours that which is holy, and you know, they go out, devour, destroy it, but then later will vow, oh, I'll figure out what happened here and make inquiry. No, don't be hasty in your, in your you know, jumping to these types of things. Make sure you have all the information first um, before you go out and, and destroy. Look at verse number 27. The spirit of man is the candle of the Lord, searching all the inward parts of the belly. Our spirit reveals unto God all of our, all, everything that's going on inside of us. It, it, it's a candle to God to see, to see all of us. Uh, verse 29, the glory of young men is their strength and the beauty of old men is the gray head. I wish that more people would realize this and, and, and just, just be biblical about it. We live in a, in a day where so many people want to dye their hair and change their appearances and cover up these types of things. But the Bible says the beauty of old men is in the gray head. You know, when my hair starts to turn gray, I'm not going to try to change it and make myself look younger or anything. There's no, there, there's the, when you're an older person, it's actually more beautiful just to let it come out. Let the gray come out. Let the wisdom be shown. Again, our culture, our society is backwards. That puts everything on the youth being, you know, like the youth are important, no doubt. We do things to help the youth, but Glory and honor should be to the older people, to the older generation, the people who have the wisdom and, and when we have, can, can respect the people that have been around and, and, um, you know, and treat for our elders. That is, is, is righteous and good. The glory of a young man, yeah, it's their strength. You know, young, younger, younger men, younger guys, they have more strength. They, they should be strong and able to do that. That's their glory, but the beauty of the old man is the gray head. Don't, uh, don't worry about those gray hairs coming in. Just let them come out. Um, verse number 30, The blueness of a wound cleanseth away evil, 
so do stripes the inward parts of the belly. Turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy 25. Last place I'm having you turn to the last verse. And I didn't bring this up last week, but it still uh, goes along with, with this week and last week. The blueness of a wound cleanseth away evil. Blueness of a wound. So it's talking about a bruise, right? It's talking about, about receiving a wound and that wound cleansing evil. Okay? The, 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 the beating that you receive causing you not to do evil again. It says, so do stripes the inward parts of the belly. And when the Bible's talking about like the inward parts of the belly, it's talking about like your flesh. It's talking about you, you, know, you giving in to your flesh and, and, and your fleshly desires, your fleshly appetites. So um, the, the stripes, right, the physical punishments or the physical beatings actually help people to not do those things anymore. And we're talking about, so we're going to look at this. I brought it up last week, but the, but the punishment in Deuteronomy 25, one of the righteous punishments that God has given in the Old Testament was a beating. And it can do some good. You know, it, last week I think it was the simple, right, or the scorner that, that is going to learn, basically, that's what they understand. When you're not wise, that, you know, sometimes all you understand is just a beating. And some people just, they just need to learn the hard way. And they keep getting in trouble with the law. And one of the punishments should just be a beating. Because, oh man, you're not going to forget that for a while. You get, you get a beating, you got that bruise. You know what happens with bruises? They last for a while. They don't go away right away. Right? You feel a bruise for sometimes for weeks. It's like, oh man, yeah, I've hurt myself before. And it's like, you keep on pressing that spot. It's a reminder right? And if you get a beating as a result of, of committing some crime, it's good to have that reminder. You don't want to do that again. Uh, it's a deterrent. Look at Deuteronomy 25, verse number 1. If there be a controversy between men and they come unto judgment, that the judges may judge them, then they shall justify the righteous and condemn the wicked, and it shall be if the wicked man be worthy to be beaten, that the judge shall cause him to lie down, and to be beaten before his face according to his fault by a certain number. Forty stripes he may give him and not exceed, lest if he should exceed and beat him above these with many stripes, then thy brother should seem vile unto thee. So God put a, a restriction on there saying, okay, you know, when you go above this limit, you're, you're just being basically like cruel to them. You're, you're being vile. And that's, that's not a good thing. And, and it's going to destroy the purpose of the beating in the first place. But the beating is a, uh, a, a righteous judgment. It is something that, that was given in God's law. It's something that's a deterrent and it's, and it's a righteous punishment. I mean, I think it's way better for someone to receive a beating than to go to prison for 10 years or whatever. You know, I mean, if they commit some kind of crime and, and the, 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 a just judgment would be, hey, receive a beating. I think, you know, the vast majority of people in prison right now would say, yeah, just give me a beating. Let's get it over with and let's move on with my life. But in the, in the effort to be humanitarian to people, oh, we can't give them a beating. Yeah, because it's so much better to lock somebody up in a cage and just keep them in there for years and destroy their family and destroy their chances of, of, of getting skills and getting a job and everything else and actually doing something that is going to be better with their life. Let's just, let's just do that. Instead of just giving them a whooping, <laughs> let, them, let them think on that for a while and, and, and move on with their life. God's judgments are always righteous and they, and they make sense. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the wisdom in this book. God, please continue to open up our hearts and our minds. Lord, help us to absorb your words. Help us not to be lazy. Help us to be... Um, to know that we need to get up and, and to just keep moving forward, to keep pressing forward. God, uh, we, we come to you and just pray that you would please uh, strengthen our spirits, to help us to be strong internally so that we could, we could force ourselves to do um, maybe what our body and our flesh doesn't want us to do. Dear God, help us to, to have that internal strength. God, help us to learn wisdom and to, and to know knowledge, dear Lord, and, and we pray that you would please guide us and direct us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.